welcome to Creative Careers Chats, a search for a new understanding of creativity and problem solving. I'm Alex Raffi. So, hi everybody. We're back to another uh, Creative Courage chat, and today I'm very excited. I got, I got, I, I'm here with a, a actual Hollywood uh, special effects artist, Tom Devlin, uh, who's worked on over a hundred feature films and has worked with many, many, many famous uh, people in his industry. Um, he's well known in, in his craft, and uh, and we have the pleasure of him being a local guy. I'm in Las Vegas. He has he has a museum, a monster museum, that is a fantastic spot to visit if you go out to Boulder City. It's got some beautiful things in there. I mean, if you like that sort of thing, I love it. I think it's fantastic. A lot of classic monsters that you get to kind of see up close and uh, up front that he's uh, he's built with his own hands. Anyway. He is the uh, very much the uh, the uh, the kind of person I'm talking about when I'm talking about somebody who's dived div, drove uh, d- divin in what was it the word dive dived in what's the word dove in I, dove in <laughs> full body dove into his creativity and uh, and explored it as much and I think that in discuss and I know I talk too much but it, in I think in discussing with him you'll find that. He will talk to us a little bit about his successes as well as failures that I'm sure he's learned from. So I think that which is very important in the creative process is to learn from your failures. But anyway, Tom, why don't you introduce yourself, tell people a little bit about what you are and what you do. So uh, my name is Tom Devlin and I own and operate the Monster Museum here in Boulder City. That is true. I've done special makeup effects for just about 20 years at this point. And uh, it, it's been, you say that I dove in, uh, I, I tell people that my superpower is diving into a pool without knowing if there's water in it. The, uh, yeah, the first time I saw you, you had a busted foot. <laughs> you <must> yeah. Have... <laughs> yeah, I had a torn Achilles tendon because I fell off the roof of a haunted house. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, I've always, I've always been a risk taker maybe more so than an artist, although I love creative art and I love being an artist. Um, I'm a learned artist. There's two types of artists. There's natural born artists, those guys that just show up and they can draw, sculpt, mold. They, they know what they're doing from birth. And then there's the ones that have to work extremely hard at practicing and, and, and um, perfecting their craft. And I am that's my my walk of life is I, I have had to train myself in every aspect of art that I, I have made a career out of. I never had a real job. I, I just convinced people to let me make them stuff. And uh, but by doing that, I've gotten better and better and better. And, um, you know, I will never say that I'm perfect at anything. We're always striving for greatness. But at the same time, I've become a competent artist, you know. Well, I think it's in terms of creativity, I think that it's actually what you're describing is the hardest thing. I think it's because it takes a t- cause it's called creative courage is what I call this thing. And the courage that you, that people have that are willing to dive in, even though they don't believe that they're as talented as a lot of people that do it, they don't have the, the skill, their love for the craft and their love for, for what it is and how it makes them feel. And, and, and all those memories of being a kid and yeah. being inspired by these things was enough to give them the courage to really pursue it. And I think that's, I'm sorry, I think that's heroic. Because I, 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 cause I do believe creativity is one of the most important things in the world. Because nothing great ever happened from people that weren't creative. The most creative people in the world have solved all of our problems and created all the most beautiful, amazing things in the world. And um, so, so I think it's, it's great. Also, I know for a fact that, that you inspire a lot of young artists with your work. Um, can, so tell us a little bit about the museum and, and then a little bit about, cause I've been in the shop and it's freaking great. It's just, it's, just the smells and everything. It's just, it's just fantastic. So tell everybody a little bit about the museum and, and your, and your shop. So i because of my career in film and television, um, when, when it came time to raise a family and stuff, we settled on Boulder city, Nevada, because it's kind of that town that time forgot where kids get to be kids. And uh, once we got here, we opened the Monster Museum. And the Monster Museum had been a, a thought in my mind for a long, long time. And uh, when we got here, we just found the perfect building and the perfect landlord and the right town to do this in. Because we do have like a very Route 66 feel here for a roadside attraction. 
And it is a kooky walkthrough kind of wax museum, not quite a haunted house. But, but what it is underneath the surface of all that is it is a completely educational in um, the preservation and celebration of practical effects. So anything from the Frankenstein monster to Freddy Krueger, a lot of people that aren't super into this don't understand that somebody made that stuff. Somebody spent their labor uh, sculpting and molding and painting those makeups. And it's, a, it's almost a lost or dying art due to the fact that the computer generated effects have really stepped in in the last 10 years. Um, so when you walk through the doors of the museum, it, it, it's educational in, in the past artists that have created certain things, certain um, actors that have portrayed those people, much like Lon Chaney or Robert England, uh, Tim Curry. And it just lets people know about the people behind the mask. And that's, that's myself. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy that makes a bunch of art that you don't realize when you're watching the movie because you're seeing a crazy killer clown, but sometimes nobody steps back to say, somebody made that, you know, and um, it's not just the actor. So that's kind of what the museum and the education process here is. Once we closed down for the COVID uh, dealings, we had to close for two months. I've completely redesigned the inside of the museum and I built a school, a full school. Oh, so, so we, a facility next, wasn't there a facility next door you were looking at? There was, that hasn't come available. So I rerouted the museum. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a classroom. The workshop you were in before is now the mold room. And then we have a little photo area and we have the haunted house out back for taking pictures and making video of our final projects. So uh, we are doing full fledged school. Um, there's a website. It is special makeup effects school.com. And uh, we start our first class in puppetry and animatronics on the 29th of this month. So it is, uh, it, it was instantly a hit. We've had people touring the school and signing up and, um, I think that I think we have an, a new element of education within the museum. And we also have kind of a fishbowl effect where when people are in the museum, they can see into the classroom and see people oh, work. Oh, that's so cool. That is, so you added that to it. That's really, really cool. It so, allows to realize that everything in that museum is handmade. And then they see the people making stuff, you know. So it's uh, kind of... It feeds each other. The the school feeds the museum legitimacy, and the the museum feeds the school potential. So, yeah. Well, I had the pleasure of working on a on a on a small uh, you know feature film here in Las Vegas with um, David Schmoller, and I know you know know him. He, he, yeah. He did, he did the Puppet Master, and he did he did a few other famous uh, horror films. Horror like, Trap. Yeah. If it weren't Schmoller and Taurus Trap, I don't know if the Monster Museum would exist. Oh, really? Yeah, so that you, movie. Yeah, huge. Huge, right? Um, and uh, and then, uh, have you worked with Tom Savini? I have never worked with Tom Savini, but I did meet him when I was fourteen years old, mm -hmm. uh, and I told him I want to do what you do. I'm I'm very interested in this, and he sent me on my path. He told me what school to attend, and uh, kind of gave me like a there you go, boy, try it out. And uh, yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing because years later, we were in a documentary together, uh, both as different um, effects artists in the same documentary. So I would like to know that he knows that, that that's where, you know, maybe he can, uh, but I don't. From what, from what I understand, he's a very nice man. It's interesting how, how people that are, you know, they're neck deep in horror and monsters are oh, actually yeah. kind of really nice people. <laughs> well, it's an awesome community. And I, that's what I tell a lot of people. You don't go to drama conventions or comedy conventions and meet Jim Carrey or anything. You go to horror conventions where you can meet Tom Savini or Kane Hodder or Robert England. Like the horror community is uh, just such a welcoming, warming place. And I did a podcast this morning of our own called Midnight at the Monster Museum with a guy named CJ Graham who played Jason Voorhees. And we were talking about when you go to that convention and meet that horror star, it's like you're part of a, inside that TV that you didn't know you could be part of. Right. So it really is, a, you know, we get a bad rap for wearing black and, and skulls or whatever, but it really is the nicest group of people you could ever meet. Sure, sure. So 
one of the things I talk about in creativity that I think is really important for people that are exploring their, their, their creativity is to think about moments of discovery in your life. Things about moments that put you on a path that really defined you and put you out there. I imagine you've had many. But oh, I have a, those yeah. moments. Yeah. Sorry? I have a checklist of those moments. Like I can <laughs> point those moments 100%. <laughs> That is awesome. See, my advice to people that want to be creative is to make notes of those moments because those define who you are and you need to look back and know those moments. Um, can, you, can you share one of the earlier ones that you had? I'll tell you the earliest one. When I was 10 years old, I had a Toxic Crusaders birthday party. <laughs> the Toxic Crusaders were kind of like the B-level Ninja Turtles at the time. And I had a Toxic Crusaders birthday party and my uncle, and I got all kinds of Toxie toys and stuff. It was an awesome cartoon. I loved the toys. And then my uncle brought me a VHS tape of a movie called The Toxic Avenger, which was the film version of The Toxic Crusaders. Now, that is not a child-friendly movie. It's, it's way rated R. And he said, I'm going to let you watch this, and I'll kind of distract your parents. And me and my three friends sat down and watched Toxic Avenger on my 10th birthday, and it changed my life. At that moment... I knew that I wanted, I didn't know I wanted to be an effects artist, but I knew I wanted to be with Toxie. I wanted to do this, whatever it was. And then that obsession went to Marvel Comics, had Toxic Avenger comic books. And I had a run of 11 of them in 1991. That was my 10th year. And I, I was born in 81. And I bought that whole run of comics and I became obsessed with Toxic Avenger. And um, I wrote, the, the director of fan mail from the time I was 15, 16. And then years later, when I was about 24, 25, they were going into production on a movie called Poultry Guys, directed by Lloyd Kaufman, who created the Toxic Avenger. So I started rapidly sculpting chicken zombies and sending him photos of those zombies. And uh, not just saying, please put this in your movie. I've, you've inspired me my whole life, put this in your movie. And then uh, he had a falling out with his current effects uh, department head. And he just started screaming in the office, call the kid, call that kid that keeps sending pictures. He'll do it. He wants to do it. Right. And I keep that movie. I was in charge of Poultry Guys. And I worked with Lloyd very closely. Wow. And um, just last year, this is crazy because I never told him of my childhood. I just sent him those pictures, right? And uh just last year, he met my dad at a screening out here in Las Vegas for the first time. And my dad's heard about Lloyd since I was a kid. Sure. And Lloyd said to my dad, he goes, look, little Tommy used to send me all that fan mail. And now he's got his own museum. And it was like, wow, I couldn't believe that he was able to connect those dots. Yeah. Somehow he did, you know. And That's great. That, that, but that moment, I, I'll never forget, that birthday was like, Okay, I love Ninja Turtles. I love He-Man. I love that stuff. It, it's inspired my kind of brain, but I want to work with this stuff. And then that happened again with the Puppet Master series. You spoke of David Schmoller. In high school, I was always a little bit on the B side of things. Like, I liked B movies. I liked punk rock, kind of lesser quality art was my that's what i love you know i like generic skateboards like veriflex and the, the low, low brow stuff the low brow kind of stuff yeah and i like hondas not harleys you know it's kind of that and so when i was in high school the puppet master videos where i, I worked at a, a video store and the puppet master videos were like the low budget Chucky, you know, to me. So I was really obsessed with the Puppet Master franchise and I bought every toy, I bought every comic and I moved to LA with the intent, I moved from Pennsylvania to, to either make Toxic Avenger or Puppet Master. And, um, and I ended up, uh, I, I am responsible for the last three Puppet Master movies and I've made hundreds and hundreds of puppet replicas and Toxic Avenger masks for Lloyd and, you know, I, my goal list may look lower on other people's scales, but that's who, I didn't come out here to work on Jurassic Park. I came out here to work on Puppet Master and that's who I ended up being. I am that guy. I'm in books for it, you know? So, yeah. um, and Dave Schmoller, such an important figure in my life. I never worked with him personally, but I did get, um, UNLV hired me to make a statue for him and present it to him at his, um, 
at his retirement ceremony. Uh, and I sculpted a puppet from Puppet Master in a college gown and cap holding a UNLV book. And I presented it to him and I gave a big speech about how without his puppets and without his little movie that he didn't even respect highly for a long time, it built passion and career for kids like me. I, I ended up living my entire dreams because this guy created a franchise that he didn't know mattered as much as it does, you know? So he's yeah, he, has, he has a massive cult following, I, I think, out in Europe uh, somewhere. <laughs> I, it's huge. I mean, huge. People, yeah, it's massive. Um, he was a really good guy. He's very patient. I remember working with him. He's very patient, very quiet, surprisingly quiet. Right. And and open minded, like really open minded, which I think you need to be. One of the things I really I picked up on right away when I first met you, and I, and I was proven right in <laughs> learning more about you, is you know you discounted a little bit about you know you know into punk rock and the stuff that most people wouldn't consider polished. But what I think is really cool about that, and what's actually really important about that, is that you identified things that felt reachable, that you thought, you know what, I think I, if I work hard, I could make that happen. I can make but that. Without saying it was a low standard. Right. But it was not. it's an achievable standard. Right. And the, the cool thing about that is through that path of achieving those standards, my life took me in a very weird journey. I, as much as I love the Toxic Avenger and the lowest budget kind of crap movies, my first job ever was on the biggest budget television show that ever existed, uh, X-Files at that time. And my mentor on that show was a guy named Tim Considine who created the Toxic Avenger for part four. And also what his first job was Toxic Avenger part two. So inadvertently- Did you, did you work on the mother, one, the mother episode on X-Files where the mom was under the bed? The, it was totally gross. <laughs> Don't remember. It was like inbred. It was like inbred family. No, no, was, no, no. Oh, that was that was a uh, that was when optic nerve did the effects. Oh, I did okay. season eight and season nine when WM oh. created the okay. effects. Um, I know exactly. Me out. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> but it was working with Tim was living my dream by kind of because he was the guy that made Toxie, but and had all these trauma stories. But I was working on huge budget stuff with him, not where I saw myself. It was a very interesting thing. And then we got to do huge things like Terminator 3 and Daredevil and these big movies. But my passion, I ended up doing later a movie called Terminators for the sci-fi channel, like a knockoff uh, for the asylum. And Terminators was almost more fun than Terminator 3 because it was like the bullshit, you know? And uh, I say that in the, in the best fashion, you yeah. know? <laughs> you have that creative control when you're in a lower lower budget setting you're not just a cog in the wheel you're it's from concept to creation my choices and my my characters so yeah, it when, really more fun when people think they're getting a bargain with the talent they're, they're willing to allow the talent to do more i think yeah uh, you know which is which is actually nice for the talent as well to go ahead and explore and stuff like that so you have uh, you live a fantastic life because you were able to be a kid every day and delve yeah. into things that you're passionate about and that's important because i think that people that are creative are always striving to reach for who they were when they were younger because you have to see the world through those younger eyes to to, to make anything valuable come come out of yourself I think that, that you know, because we get stifled, right? We get stifled as we get older, we get told no, and we get we start to get cynical. And then we lose that wonderful thing, you know, of, of sitting there and just contemplating lollipops like you look out the window. You know, I lost it. Like there's been many, many times in recent career where I I used to be the biggest horror fan that ever existed, and I get to plateaus where I think that I'm not there like you know it becomes a job and you have to meet other people's expectations and there's stresses and politics and a lot of it gets away so i resorted back to my childhood in ways like i remember not too long ago when i opened the museum i built a rock of fire explosion band which is the showbiz pizza band i i set one of them up in the museum and people are like why are these robots here and i was like because i love them and it's my place. And then I built this dinosaur adventure yeah. park here 
It's supposed to be like a kid's Look. theme park and you ride dinosaurs. Animatronic, go, right? Animatronic like, dinosaurs. Yeah. Both cave systems and stuff. And it was a financial disaster. And uh, we call it the dinosaur disaster because uh, although I was chasing my childhood, I have two children and I was building it for them and they loved it. We didn't, we had no marketing. We had no business savvy in that world. I underestimated the Monster Museum. The Monster Museum's success is attributed to the fact that I've been a part of this industry for two decades yeah. where I have no business in a kid's museum, a kid's attraction. So right. um, I learned a hard lesson with yeah. that one. You know? Yeah, I know of a marketing firm if you're ever looking for one. I'm pretty good. I, cool. you, <laughs> I, think I actually met you like, Three days after we closed the doors. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but um, th yeah, that's unfortunate. But it's a, it's a testament to your the big picture of what you're trying to do. And you got to take shots. And you got to yeah. and you got to fail on your own terms. And I think that's important. And I, and I think there's something to be learned there. People who are afraid to fail don't accomplish anything. And they that's never... a hero of, power of jumping into a pool without knowing if there's water in it. Right. There is no fear of failure in my life because. Well, if, if you don't fail, you're not going to learn how to succeed or you're not going to appreciate success, you know. So we've failed quite a, quite a bit. Well, yeah, and you're still kicking. You're still around. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and I think that's, that's important to think about. I think that people, that a lot of times, they're too scared to try something different because of that failure. And, and it's funny, and I, and I brought this up in the last talk that I have, is I think that's like something from a primal that we have, you know, that your gut – is 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 good to follow sometimes but other other times it protects you too much you know the, it's the thing that tells you don't go in the cave because there's a bear in the cave it's the same thing that i'll say don't try that idea even though you're not going to get eaten by a bear you won't try it you have the same amount of fear about trying an idea that you would uh, of a bear in a cave and it keeps us from doing things it keeps us from we end up settling and it, and it's and it's and, and this this uh, podcast and this this whole goal I have is not intended to be a motivational speech. It's intended to motivate people to move and to do something. Because, you know, right now in the world, we're victims of bad choices and people that are afraid of things. And we don't have good ideas right now. We don't have people like, you know, people don't realize that the, the same uh, uh, muscles you're using to create, uh, you know, swamp thing you know, to figure out all the little nuancey parts of that are the same muscles that are used by a brain surgeon or a, a yeah. lawmaker and, and, or anybody that does anything else. And the, that energy that's happening in your brain, it's totally exactly the same. It just has a different goal. I mean, yours yeah. is to make cool monsters. There should be to find a cure for cancer. You know what I'm saying? And um, so I think it's important. I think it's actually the most important thing in, out there. So, so anyway, we, we kind of got to the level to where I usually go to where I'm, I'm going to say this is enough. Uh, so, so did you have anything that you wanted to share any more that you wanted to share or that you're doing? Did you share all the, not you, we do another recap of all the things that you're doing so that people know how to get a hold of you and learn more about the museum and stuff like that. So if you guys are in the Las Vegas area, please come out to Boulder city. It's only a hop, skip and away. We're about 20 minutes off the strip. Um, and uh, come check out the Monster Museum. It's always changing, it's always improving. Uh, it is a kind of a nonstop work in progress, um, which, which I really like about it. Uh, that being said, if you're, if you're local and you're interested in learning the art of special makeup effects, or just wanna come check out the school, it's in the same facility, and uh, we'd be happy to give a tour anytime. And you can look at specialmakeupfxschool.com. And that's just the letter F and X. Um, but, uh, and we have a YouTube channel called Monster Museum Network where we post a weekly news show and we also put up whatever we're doing at the time. And we do a podcast as well called Midnight at the Monster Museum on Spotify, iTunes. It's available on YouTube, uh, Stitcher, all that stuff. Fantastic. Yes, yeah, just spending a few minutes with Tom, you'll see that, it's infectious, his energy, his excitement about what he does, his love for what he does. You see it in the work. You see it in the students that work, that work there as well. It's really a cool place. When you're driving into Boulder City, it's on the left. Look for the hearse. Is the hearse still out in front of the thing? Two of them, yeah. Yeah, so, so look, look for the hearse that's out there in front, and you'll see it. It's on the left right as you go in. 
and it's definitely yeah. worth a, 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 to stop by and, and check out check especially now i'm gonna have to swing by because you made changes so I'll, I'll swing by i'll see if i can try to do it this week i haven't been out to boulder city because of the quarantine nonsense and all that stuff but, we have um, a, uh we're having a big um celebration on july 11th which oh, okay. is our, our three-year anniversary and we'll have a uh, cj graham who played jason Voorhees here signing autographs that's cool and we'll Lisa Wilcox from Nightmare on Elm Street 4 and 5 here as well, who played Alice. Oh, so, that's awesome. Yeah, it should be really cool. Well, I'll put links to your website and, and all that stuff on there on, on where I post it. Hey, thanks for making the time, Tom. I really no, appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. And uh, anyway, you like, subscri subscribe, do all the crazy stuff that people tell you to do for YouTube and all that stuff, and check us out on I do a podcast. This will become a podcast too. So, so it'll be fun to share. Anyway, thanks again, and go see the museum. It's awesome.